Okay, so in my last lecture, we talked about uh, disagreements about values. And I tried to show that a disagreement about values doesn't really work in the same in the way that the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy describes. First and foremost, because when we disagree about values, it's very hard to say that he is right and I am wrong. And I put forward a view that systems of values are human, they're, they're social, cultural constructions, and they usually adapt to the needs of the person or the society or the culture which has created the values. So we can't really say this is true or false, but we can say this works, and this society, this set of values really works. We can also say it doesn't work. I gave the example of Kant. Kant talked about this imaginary society where everyone adopted the maxim, it's fine to lie whenever we have a business interest. Um, and in a society like that, could probably never work. Now from that, we got some conclusions. Assuming that's true, which of course you're allowed to disagree. Um, it may be that you can have more, if you have different environments, you may have different value systems. The value system which works over here, which works, let's say, in modern corporate America, probably doesn't work very well for hunter-gatherers in, uh, in the Kalahari Desert. And even if we, have, if we live in the same society, we can find different sets of values which work equally well. So uh, we don't know how to say one of these is better or one is worse. Now, one possible conclusion from that is, oh, it's just everything is equal. Uh, there's no way we can judge. Let's just go on taste. But uh, I rejected that idea. Because although you can have more than one set of values which work, there are values which very definitely don't work. And maybe one who I was citing calls them inadequate value systems. So if I, my value system says I should always lie, or if my value system says that to defend Western civilization, I could go and shoot up a school or people in a shopping mall, it's quite likely that system of values is inadequate. But you get, there's an obvious objection to everything I'm saying. You say, sure, that's true about values, but values are special. What about facts? So maybe we can't decide if a set of values is true or false. But if I say uh, the name of Aunt Jane's husband is Tom, there exists really a fact of the matter. Either it is either his name is Tom, or maybe his, his name is Peter or James or something else. And I could be right or wrong about that. If I say 2 plus 2 equals 4, or 11 is a prime number, I'm right about that. If I say 2 plus 2 equals 5, and 11 is not a prime number, then I'm wrong about that. And we usually agree. So it seems, oh, I lost my screen. Uh -oh. I didn't press that anyway, so I just didn't press the door for a long time. Um, so I, I'm not going to contest the example, but some facts exist, like the ones I've just been saying. But um, if you look at the whole list we have, of um, of um, possible disagreements. First of all, we see a lot of things which are not facts, which are definitely not facts at all. 
Should the Philippines legalize abortion? This is a question about policy. It may be a question about values. Should we allow immigration from Muslim countries? Again, it's policy and values. If your dog dies and it's okay to eat it, it's policy. Should we rename our philosophy courses? It's policy. It's policy. Um, different views of feminism because it's okay for male students to validate or disvalidate female views. How should I behave in my uh, in my Facebook group if I have a sexual predator who is part of it or a suspected one? What should I think about uh, the Marcos burial? What should I think about trans women in public restrooms? All of these are things that values. So the first conclusion I have is that quite often disputes about facts aren't very interesting. Like very often when there's a factual dispute, there's someone who clearly knows better. We call him my epistemic superior. So if we're talking about how someone is going to replace a valve in my heart or a valve in my car, my surgeon or my mechanic are my epistemic superiors in that domain. I trust them. Um, if I'm flying a plane, the pilot is my epistemic superior about flying planes. I'm not going to tell him, I don't think we should accelerate the engines. If he thinks we should accelerate the engines, well, I'm going to trust him to do it. So these are rather boring disagreements. Now it gets a bit more interesting when I don't know who my epistemic superior is. So if I'm talking about, for instance, uh, a certain, uh, whether I should or should, um, I don't know, um, about whether this medicine is better than that, and we're two doctors. I don't know if he knows better than me, or I know better than him. I'm really not sure. And there's a lot of cases like that. Now, I'm going to, Okay, I have some cases here, like, is attention deficit disorder and hyperactivity disorder, is that really a disease? Um, does the Earth go around the sun, or the sun go around the Earth? Uh, do men differ from women in their brain structures? Now, these are things where, even among experts, there may be differences. So, these are the sort of things I want to talk about today. I don't want to talk about very simple facts like the name of Andy Jane's husband. We're never going to seriously disagree with that. I want to talk about science and science sort of facts, like this one, like the one about the Earth going around the sun. And I'd like to start with, as quite often I do, with a personal story. It's uh, this time. The disagreement is about mental health. So a friend of mine, someone I know, was going through a very difficult time. Uh, she was having huge difficulty in concentrating. She was finding it very difficult to study. She was vastly confused about her direction for her future career when she left the university. Uh, she kept on forgetting appointments. Uh, she lost her sense of time, she would consistently come to things on the wrong day or the wrong day for the wrong time. Uh, one day she was driving, she got distracted in a very stupid way and she nearly got into an accident and the accident would she avoided the accident, but it would have been, if she had had the accident, it would have been completely her fault. So she went to a psychiatrist. I'm a psychiatrist. Very quickly, and this is for me a negative, very quickly, in about 20 minutes, said, ah, oh, you've got attention deficits and hyperactivity syndrome and uh, disorder, and he gave her a prescription for a drug called Ritalin, which is a stimulant, which is known to act in these conditions. Now, I, I was talking to her a few weeks after this, and it, was, it really was a very heated discussion, and I questioned whether ADHD should be classed as a disease at all. Um, in my view, I was just being scientific. I knew the literature about this, and I thought there were reasonable grounds to doubt. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the grounds to doubt later on. But what's important here is that it was 
a very beautiful description. She thought I was completely denying her suffering and distress, which were very definitely real. Um, you're not a doctor. I was told it by the psychiatrist. It must be true. And uh, also, a bit more, a bit more cruelly, uh, ADHD is recognised in DSM-5, which is the bible of all psychiatrists. It's an official diagnosis. There's a checklist of the symptoms you must have to have ADHD. And furthermore, she had her treatment, and she felt it was working. She felt the treatment was good. So she had a million different reasons uh, to stick to her guns and say, yes, I really think this is a business. So, in brief, uh, she was arguing ADHD is a fact, it really exists, and I haven't. And I was arguing ADHD is not a fact, I'll say why, and, well, and if it's not a fact, you can't have it. So I think we need to look a little bit closer at the concept of what is a fact, and what is a fact we can disagree about. Now, philosophers who believe in the existence of an objective world outside my head are called realists. One realist, not the only one, was the early Wittgenstein. If you read the very beginning of the Tractatus, you will read that the world divides into facts. And I make the representation of, um, of the facts in my head, and the representation accurately represents the facts of the world as it is, that he would add, and anything else is a waste of time. Um, so, this is what we call a correspondence theory of truth. Um, on the one hand, I have the world, represented here by this candle. On the other hand, I have my perceptions of the world. And, this, and the relationship between them is what the, a mathematician calls a bijective relationship. You don't have to learn that word. Um, it means that for every fact which exists in the world, there exists an appropriate representation for that fact. And for every representation, there exists an appropriate fact out in the world which it represents. But this vision of reality has been contested right from the beginning of philosophy. Uh, take, sorry. Ah, sorry, yeah, okay. I don't mean that. So take Plato, for instance. Plato imagined our representations as the shadows on the wall of a cave. There is there are people or things walking about outside the cave. The sun is shining on them and they cast a shadow. But notice this is not a bijective relationship in the sense of the correspondence theory of the truth. Because things which are very different can cast the same shadow. And things which are the same can cast different shadows. So there is absolutely not a one-to-one -one relationship between the shadows on the back of the cave and the external reality. And yes, I can say some interesting things about the shadows, but I do not know the external reality. Now I have a friend called Michael Herzog who works, works in both in philosophy and neuroscience in Switzerland, in my university. And he says that his that psychophysics, the study of the way the human perceptual system reacts to objects, confirms Plato's vision. He has lots and lots of examples. He's just writing a paper of it. I can I have a few of the paper. If anyone wants it, I have not put in the reading materials. It's not published yet. 
sorry, but if you all square silence, uh, you can read it, but it's not to be shown at the end. But anyway, we take some examples. We look at an object, and we, see, we perceive the object is either dark, like the back of Jackie's computer, or shining, like the back of my computer. Now, can I say how bright the object actually is? The answer is absolutely no. Because the brightness of the object depends on the one hand, on the strength of the light illuminating it, and on the other, on the reflective power of the object. And if I increase the strength of the light and, def uh, and decrease the reflection of the power of the object, I continue to see exactly the same thing. So there's no way by observing this object, I can actually work out how bright it actually is. He calls this an ill-posed Ill question. There's no way from the observation I can get back to the object. Now, let's go back to philosophy and move on, well, move back a couple of hundred years from my, my friend Michael and move forward a couple of thousand years from Plato. And we come to we come to Kant. Now Kant is a sort of realist. He believes there exists an objective outside world called the phenomenon. But he says we have no access to this world. All that we have access to is our observations of the world. So we have our sense impressions what we get through our eyes, our ears, our touch, and so forth. We can also use instruments. Uh, we can also, so we can use a microscope, a telescope, uh, a ruler, anything else which we can use to measure something. But when I actually do science, I am, what I discover are not relationships between real things and the real world. I, I discover phenomenal relationships. I discover relationships between my observations. So I can make rules and laws about how my observations fit together. But they are objects. They are not the, the thing in itself, the thing which we presume exists in the outside world. Now that has some implications which Kant does not draw, which I'm going to draw in. Now if everything we get comes from our perceptual system, that means that people with different perceptual systems will get different sets of facts. And it means also that it's, me it's meaningless to say this is true in absolute terms. But I can say that for an animal with a, or a human with a certain set uh, a certain perceptive system and with a certain set of instruments, it is true for that perceptive system and for that set of instruments. So there is a sort of ob objectivity about it, but I'm still talking about the phenomena, and I'm talking about the phenomena relative to a specific species. And in the 19th century, there was in fact a school of philosophy called species relativism. So, there is a truth, but only for my species. It doesn't apply to species which are very different. So, let's go forward to a, to a modern philosopher. Uh, Thomas Nagel, who's always worth reading, in 1975 published a very short and wonderful paper, which is in your reading materials, called What It's Like to Be a Bat. Now bats have a visual system which is rather like our own, so this roughly the same things. But they also have a completely different perceptual system which we don't have at all. They have an echo location system. Because bats usually go out at night, it's dark, and there's no light to see. So they bounce echoes of objects, and from the echoes they can determine what the object is, they can determine how fast the object is, is moving, in what direction the object is moving, how big it is, and so on, and so forth. Now, from Nagel's point, Nagel wasn't really interested 
in disagreement, at least not in this case. He was interested in consciousness. So what he said was that the form of the bat's consciousness, or the content of the bat's consciousness, is completely inaccessible to us, just like our consciousness is completely inaccessible to the bat. Um, let's say that using its perceptual system, the bat says a certain form of object is a bjork. I've invented the word. It's a bjork. I have no way of working out from my perceptual system whether what the bat is looking at is a bjork or not. Because he, the bat has ways of perceiving that I just don't have. So it's not meaningful for me to make statements of truth or falsehood, falsehood for the bat's world. Now, if... Yeah, I'm just going to New York and that's all about the same thing. Um, if, now, if it was only a different species which had different perceptions, it wouldn't be too bad. Because, you know, we don't, I, there are no bats in this philosophy class. But we also think that um, different human beings have different perceptions, perceptual systems too. Um, this diagram comes from a very famous paper called The Greek Groups. I want to go a little experiment. Um, can, can you tell me, using a single word, what color is this? One word. Blue. And um, without saying blue, it's not the answer. <laughs> can, you say, can you say what color this is? No. Um, okay. Oh, okay. So this, one, this one's yellow or green. Actually, in my pictures, it looks a bit better than that. But anyway, the point which you didn't, it doesn't really come from the, our experiment, our experiment failed, is that if the colors were the proper colors, that is blue. That is blue, that is yellow or green. And in most languages we know, there's only one word, one word covers both of these. But for the Greeks, and also for the Italians, they have two completely different words, and they see nothing in common between this and that. One word in Italian, this is celeste, which means sort of light blue. And this is azzurro, which means dark blue. And the two are regarded as being having absolutely nothing in common. Like when we say dark blue and light blue, we think of them as shades of the same color. The Greeks and the Italians do not. So in this rather insignificant example, which I haven't been able to prove, uh, they're different. I'll give you another example. In 2010, Joe Hendricks published another wonderful paper, a Denio reading materials, called the weirdest people in the world. And really, he made this argument. He said, first of all, nearly all the results we have from experimental psychology come from studies in what he calls weird countries. Weird means Western, educated, industrial, rich, and democratic. And most countries don't meet all those criteria. And he says, these countries aren't weird just because they're Western educated and so on. The psychology and the perceptual systems of people in these countries are also weird. So if I get a result in psychology which is true in Stanford or true in Cambridge, that does not mean it's true for humans throughout the world. I'll give just one example. Uh, this is what's called the Wheeler Liar Illusion. Uh, which line do you think is longest? A or B? But don't use your cognition, just respond what you actually see. Sorry? B. What do other people think? Okay, so you're Americans. Uh, Americans and English people, so Europeans, respond overwhelmingly. B. So Henry quotes literature, secondary literature, but it's not his own study, where they've repeated this text all over the world, and they get vastly different 
these are Europeans and Americans here, and they see a huge difference. This is, this is the size of the difference you see, they see between the two lines. But if you go and look at my famous hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari Desert, the sand hunters, they see basically no difference between the two states. So, and various other people are intermediate between this. So, different, not only different um, species, but different cultures can also see things very differently. I insist on the word cultures because genetically, a sand hunter is almost identical to an American corporate executive. Genetically, humans are not very different from one place to another. So it'd be very weird that this was accounted for by genetics. But of course, the culture of an American corporate executive and a sand hunter are very, very different. Um, so, where, where can we get from, from here? We can look, it's probable, that these different ways of looking at reality reflect the environmental needs of these different cultures. So, modern Americans and Europeans don't really have a huge need to be really, really accurate about uh, visual perception. And they make some fast guesses, heuristic guesses, based on direction of arrows and things. And they see the illusion. Sand hunters, it's vital. They always get distances right. Because they're shooting at animals. They have to hit the animals. And any visual illusion is going to interfere with that ability. So they are very, very skillful at perceiving visual things. And for them, it's, it's very important they should not be victims of illusions. And strange, strange to say, they're not. So I can say, I can't say that some of these perceptual systems, like once you see two blues, one you see one blue, is true or one is false. But I can say that some ways of perceiving reality can be more useful for species or for a culture than other ways of perceiving reality. Some sets of facts, some way of dividing the world into facts can, have, can be more useful than another way in a specific environment. It doesn't mean it has to be universally better everywhere. It means it's universally, it means it's better at one time and in one place. So, I'd like to go back to the disagreement about the difference. So, but to my discussion about ADHD, and this time I'd like to look at the arguments both ways. You'll find a selection of four or five different articles about ADHD in your reading materials, with half of them make an argument that it is an important medical diagnosis. It's useful and we should keep it. And without, the other half was two articles, big articles, in the New York Times, making the opposite argument. This is not a good diagnosis. Now, why does my friend think that ADHD, that ADHD is a disease? Well, first of all, people who, who are diagnosed in this way go to the psychiatrist because they have real distress. People say, if I'm distressed, there's something really wrong. If I feel a fever, if I feel deep pain in some part of my body, there's something wrong. So distress, yes, it's a normal symptom of some sort of disease. Now then, if they study the literature, they will find that ADHD is officially recognized in the DSM-5, and they'll find that a very large number of extremely important and authoritative psychiat psychiatrists will say that this is a really useful diagnosis. So they have authority on their side. They can find very authoritative voices speaking in favor of this. Uh, in fact, many, many psychiatrists 
believe in surreal disease, and they think it's dramatically underdiagnosed, particularly many American psychiatrists believe that it's underdiagnosed and undertreated, and uh, that the world would be a better place if we had better diagnosis for this and, and more treatment. There's a widespread social belief that it's a true, belief, uh, that it's a true disease. If, uh, if uh, my friend talks to any doctor or a psychiatrist, or appears, they will all say, yeah, sure, it's a disease. And patients find their diagnosis intuitively believable. What the psychiatrist tells them sort of matches what they've experienced themselves. And it's a fact that if you take the drug, that there's Ritalin, there's two or three other drugs you can take, it does have an effect. And people perceive this effect as being good. So all this justifies the existence of ADHD as a fact, cure. But there is a counter argument. First of all, distress is not proof of the existence of a disease. If you torture me, I am going to be in deep, deep distress. But I do not diagnose myself as suffering from torture perception syndrome. You know, that, that would be wrong. This is not a disease. It's because someone's hurt it. Second, in the, in the diseases which everyone accepts as a disease, like flu, or cancer, or heart disease, or pneumonia, there's a clear causal mechanism involved. I know that flu is due to a virus, which I can see. I, can, I know that pneumonia is, is due, due either to a virus or a bacteria. I can culture it in the lab. I can see it. Um, I know that cancer is due to uncontrolled multiplication of cells. I know that heart disease is due to a breakdown in normal heart physiology. In the case of ADHD, in the case of the huge majority of mental disorders, we have no known causal mechanism. So we don't know anything which goes on in the brain or the body which we can reliably state with evidence that it's the cause of the disease. You will hear that in all mental diseases, you'll be told it's due to chemical imbalances in the body. But you should know we've never found these imbalances. This is, there is no empirical evidence for this. Um, so that means there are no reliable biomarkers. If I think you've got cancer, I'm going to do a test, and I will tell you reliably whether you have it or not. If you have pneumonia, the same. I can culture bacteria from your lungs, and I will tell you if you have pneumonia or not. We have no reliable test for any mental disorder, basically. Um, then we note that diagnosis, rates of diagnosis vary enormously. It, between the United States and Europe, it's about 20 to 1 in favor of the United States. And this is about a bit like the differences in value that we talked about the other day. Uh, I said, you know, over 2,000 years, we've never got a reliable interpretation of what it means, thou shalt not kill. Well, the same applies here. We don't have reliable diagnoses for these, for these diseases. Psychiatrists differ enormously. We also know that the pharma industry has pushed enormously for the recognition of this diagnosis as it enables them to sell drugs. Uh, we also know that doctor and patient beliefs are not a reliable to guide to what is true. A uh, hundred years ago, doctors used to bleed their patients, and doctors were convinced this did their patients good. Patients were also convinced that it did them good, it just wasn't true. Uh, the quality of the clinical studies done on ADHD is very poor, study groups are poor, the results aren't very replicable. And finally, it is absolutely true that these drugs have an effect on your brain and your body. That's true. But some people think the beneficial effect is vastly overrated. It may just be a placebo effect. And what you're mistaking for a real effect is just one of the side effects. Uh, Ritalin is enough. It will put you in a hang room, but so will coffee. So, there's a very coherent case for, I, I don't want to dismiss the case for the validity of this diagnosis, but you can also 
made a case against. Let's move from, so this is more or less scientific, to uh, more folk, the sort of folk information we're all exposed to. I read in the New York, New York Times again about four or five months ago an account of ADHD by a journalist who had been diagnosed. And he said, for me, taking clothes out of the dryer and folding them, that's like climbing Mount Everest. For years, they, uh, I paid bills where things got shut off. Oh, I, well, I, I failed I failed to pay, pay bills. It was a cycle. It was almost impossible to get out of. I was talking about someone else's idea. It destroyed their credit. It only got solved when finally this poor man got married and he got um, a wife who taught him to behave even more reasonably. Now, when, um, when my friend read this quote, she said, ah, oh, great, That's, that describes exactly what's wrong with me. I do all these things, and therefore the journalist confirms that ADHD is a useful diagnosis. Now, I read exactly the same thing, but my nature of reaction was totally different. I said, well, I hate taking clothes out of the front. I never take them out. I take them out when I need them. Folding them, I hope someone else is going to do them. Uh, yeah, I don't like that. And pay bills, I pay bills on the very last day when it's possible or when I get a reminder notice. And um, so on and so forth. And I said, sure, I do all of that. I'm not sick, I'm great. So we both got the same information from the journalist. Uh, but we both interpreted it in, exact, in totally opposite directions, which is a bit like what happened when we had the discussion about uh, about Muslim immigration. So I think the, in both cases, um, we were so, we, we had very strong confirmation bias for our own views. Um, certainly, I had plenty of bias my own. My parents were doctors, and doctors, most doctors who are not psychiatrists, have an incredibly poor view of psychiatrists. Um, they would say, "Where well, no one's going to shrink ever." So I inherited that very negative view. I was also brought up in the 1970s when there was a huge amount of what's called anti-psychiatry. Uh, this was, has there, have you seen, have ever used, any of you ever seen a film called One Blue Over the Cuckoo's Nest? Yeah. It's Ken Kesey and it's Jack Nichols yeah. and he's a rebel and they just say he's mad and they give him electric shocks, shocks until they finally succeed in destroying his brain. So I like rebels and I like Jack Nichols and therefore I did not like psychiatrists. By extension, <laughs> I did not like um, I did not like this diagnosis of ADHD. But I have to admit, uh, my friend's psychiatrist was not like Jack Nichols' psychiatrist. She was perfectly gentle. She was a perfectly gentle woman. Um, my friend likes going there and thinks it's very useful. So we have a conflict. Um, where does this get us philosophically? So, proposition ADHD is a disease looks like a statement of fact. But in reality, what we have is one community of psychiatrists, not all of them, but many, patients, not all of them, but many, drug companies, which attaches the meaning of certain symptoms, ADHD is a disease. And we have a second unit in meaning, which says, no, it's not. So there are two interpretations, basically, of the same data. And this looks not so much like fact in the sense of Aunt Jane's husband's name is Tom, it looks much more like one of the conflicts of value we had before, where one set of people argue that it's safe for abortion and another set of people argue against. In both cases, 
community has constructed a meaning. And here we have two communities which have constructed two different meanings. And that is what the disagreement is really about. So, how can we evaluate who is right and who is wrong in this disagreement? Well, first of all, I don't think there are any indisputable groups that say that I am right and my friend is wrong. And there are no indisputable groups to discuss, to say the opposite either, but uh, she is right and I am wrong. What we can do is discuss the usefulness to classifications. But if we do, again, we find neither position is self evidently inadequate. Um, you know, people who have their diagnosis and get treated are very often very happy with what they've received. They believe the doctor has solved their problem. So saying their identification of this as a disease is wrong. Well, I don't have the grounds for doing that because they find it a very helpful classification. Um, at the same time, uh, classify, classifying something with disease, uh, classifying many conditions of distress as diseases, I think it really can have unhelpful social consequences. So I can make that argument as well. But fundamentally, neither side is going to win this. Because I am not going to convince my friend that she's wrong. And she's not going to convince me that I'm wrong. What I would suggest is that our discussion can be useful, can help both of us to refine our respective positions. And it can be interesting for the support, our supporters and mutual observers. You're listening to this, I hope none of you have a diagnosis of this kind. I'm not trying to convince you to either side of this, of this argument, but hopefully looking at the argument can, can cast some light on what you think, regardless of what your current position is. So, if on the one hand we can say that knowledge about this disorder can help more patients seek treatment, but this can be helpful, it may, it may avoid some really severe harm to them. On the other hand, uh, broader awareness that all distress requires medical treatment in some way, but sometimes there's other ways of getting that. That can also be very helpful. So I'm going to leave this one unevaluated for a moment. I'm going to change the subject. And that is, you could say that's a lay disagreement. So actually, doctors and scientists do disagree violently about that So it's not just a lay disagreement. But at least you could say there's some open opinions on that. But let's take a completely different example. Does the Earth go around the sun? Or does the sun go around the earth? Well, I'm not going to ask you to let me know. Um, I think we all know, we're all fully convinced that the earth goes around the sun. Right? It's not really, possibly Donald Trump, I don't think anyone <laughs> really has any doubts about it. If you know where, where the earth and the sun are, has any real doubts about this. But in the 16th and 17th century, this was vastly controversial. So the second disagreement I'm going to talk about in my lecture today is the, the disagreement between the heliocentric vision, the sun in the center, that's the Copernicus vision, and the older vision, which was that the Earth is in the center of the universe. Can anyone tell me some of the key names who were involved in this, in this controversy? Yes, Galileo. Galileo, very definitely, yes. Thank you, Kepler. Kepler, thank you, Johannes Kepler, we're getting there. One more slightly more modern, not very modern. Start to sounds. Sorry? I start to sounds. Yes, we're not going on. I said more modern. Oh. <laughs> going a long way back. Newton. Newton. Very definitely, because Newton. Um, I think we get, was Tito Brahe as well, we can mention that. Okay. That's a pretty good account. There's a wonderful book about this controversy, which is long. It's called The Copernican Revolution. It's by Thomas Kuhn. 
but it's one of the best books of science history I've ever read. It's how you should. I, I don't want to be knowledgeable, but it's how you should write. <laughs> if you can write a book like that, then you may, you know. It's, it tells you all the details, but it also draws philosophical consequences from, from the debate. But anyway, I've got quite a lot to say, so I'll carry on. So, um, up to the Middle Ages, until the mid 16th century, apart from some early astronomers who thought that the sun was in the center, uh, people thought that the Earth was in the center and all the other things moving around the Earth the Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun further out, Mars, Jupiter, the Saturn, and far, far away, infinite stars also moved around the Earth. Now, in 1543, that's, that's actually a bit of a caricature of the truth theory. It was more complicated than that, I'll get to that later. But that's a space, an ultra simplified version of the theory. Um, in 1840, whenever it was, 46, 43, Copernicus said, no. Actually, if you take the observations and really study the way the stars move, you have no, no telescope or anything. What we, we can explain it much better if we say the Sun is the center. Uh, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn go round the Sun. The stars are very distant, don't know what it's called, and the moon goes round the Earth. Now, you'll have heard of from history books, but this was a huge controversy. Actually, when Copernicus published his work, it wasn't a huge controversy. It was very, very technical, and basically, it was read by 10 or 20 astronomers. He dedicated the book to the Pope. It wasn't, it wasn't meant to be an anti church book in the least. And for a very long time, no one noticed. Uh, but as time moved on, this view did become very, very controversial. But this is, of course, this is the same period as the Reformation. And the, the Protestants were attacking the church for its doctrines. They said the church has lots of doctrines which have no biblical justification of any kind, um, including this one. Um, and, uh, and the church doubled down and said, what we say is true, which was a more rigid position. The church actually had uh, in the century before the Reformation. So, and by the time Galileo comes along, 1633, Galileo is actually put on trial for making the opposite for defending the penance. And the church is actually shown the instruments of torture, and, he's, and they tell tell Galileo, if you don't recount, if you don't say that what you said, what you said was an interesting thing. Hypothesis. Not actually true. Then we're going to torture. Them. So Galileo, shut up. Uh, but I'm getting a bit ahead. I'd like to say where this theory came from. Uh, what was the origin of the theory, and why did the Penguins disagree with the traditional view? Now, everyone knew at this time that pure heliocentric pure uh, theory with the Earth at the center would not explain everything that you could see in the skies with your naked eye. In particular, was what was called the retrograde um, motion of the planets. If, if, the, if a planet is going around the Earth, the Earth is still, I should always see it going in the same direction. But when I actually observe, I find that sometimes the planet goes backwards across the sky. And the theory, with the uh, original theory, that the Earth is at the center can't explain that at all. Now, uh, Ptolemaeans explained it by creating a system of what they call epicycles. So they said, we have the planet going around the Earth. Actually, it doesn't go straight round. The planet is on a sort of bicycle wheel, which is spinning the whole time as it goes round, and therefore it goes backwards and forwards, and this explains the retrograde motions 
and see. Actually, one bicycle wheel was enough. They had to have wheels within wheels within wheels. But they, and they never completely managed to, uh, managed to explain what was happening. Now, Benicus gave a much simpler explanation. He said the planets go at different speeds. So when one overtakes the other, if I looked at it from, from the Earth, if they go at different speeds, then they sometimes will move backwards and forwards in their motion. There's a, a diagram here showing it, which you can see when you see the shared, the shared version of the shared, um, shared slides. So Copernicus's explanation explained exactly why we saw what we do see. And he was able to make precise predictions of what we would see at what time. Now, um, this is a lesson about philosophy and not about astronomy, so I don't want to carry on with all the details of all the arguments. Kuhn explained this extremely well. If you want to do a thesis on that, you can read it. But the important point is that Galileo comes along. And Galileo was something very important. But in Holland, they just invented eyeglasses. And they converted eyeglasses in telescopes so they could watch ships at sea. Galileo takes a telescope, eyes one, he points it at the sky. And he points it particularly at the planet Jupiter. And he discovers, you can't see very well here, that he saw four dots moving around Jupiter. That's exactly, if you replace Jupiter with the Sun, uh, this is exactly what Copernicus is saying about the planets going around the Sun. So he said, aha, in the solar system, there's an object that behaves exactly the same way that Copernicus is saying uh, that, uh, that, that the um, that the Earth moves around the Sun. But he did something much more important than that. He published a book which is called the Dialogo de Massimi Sistemi del Mondo, the Dialogue of the Greatest Systems in the World. And this book is set up like a Socratic dialogue between three or four characters, one of whom represents traditional church philosophy is called Simplicius, the simple one, or the fool. And in this dialogue, Galileo produces a huge number of arguments, why the Pericles is right. And more importantly still, he does it in completely non-technical language. You can read it. It's perfect. The translation is perfectly understandable. And he does it in a way which is very fun and completely unfair. So, you know, this is the time of the Reformation. All the Europeans, you know, they have confirmation bias. You're saying something why the church is wrong. Well, that's great. Let's, let's jump on board. Fifty years after he published his book, every single literate European wasn't prepared. So, he won. But, um, and the church lost. But let's just look at his arguments a little bit. Now, one of his key points was what we see in the real world is not absolute motion, but relative motion. But he, the, opponents, the opponents of the benefits said, ah, but the Earth can't possibly be moving through space. But suppose I take a ball and I drop it. If the Earth was moving through space, the ball would fall behind me because I moved away. Well, that's not what I see. If I drop it, it drops straight down beside me. And um, Galileo said, rubbish. That's because you're thinking in terms of absolute motion. But all we ever observe is relative motion. For instance, if I'm a sailor, I'm on a boat, and I start writing a letter to my mother, I write a paper to get left behind me. My pencil, the ink, the paper, and the boat all move in harmony. So, if I look at the world in this way, and it gives us good technical reasons why I should, then 
I can then I can see what Copernicus describes. This is so what he actually does is he invents a new language for describing the facts. In the Ptolemaic system, we use a language of absolute motion. And actually, I, I won't demonstrate why, but in that language, the Ptolemaic system works pretty well. Uh, Galileo produced a language of relative motion. And in that language, the Galilean system works very, very well. So, basically what we have is we've created what we call what philosophers of science call an observation language, but basically, using our language, we've created two different sets of facts. Galileo uses his language and translates astronomical observations into that language. His attackers um, invent another language, they express their observations in that language. And at the time of Galileo, there was no way you could actually say it was right. So this is just assertion and counter-assertion. Um, now today, we know that Galileo was right. From him, they, at his, while he was still alive, we got Kepler, as you mentioned, who worked out better rules for the orbits of the planets. Actually, they're not circles, they're ellipses. Uh, we then got Newton, who invented the laws of motion we use today. Using those laws of motion, we can launch spacecraft and predict exactly when they're going to arrive on a planet 20 or 30 years later. So these, in terms of usefulness, these things work incredibly, incredibly well. And so, I would say, this is now an adequate theory, um, and other theories are inadequate. But that's not why the theory won. Bellingham theory won, because it, or rather Galileo version of it won, because it was an anti-church, anti-conformist theory, which people were politically ready for, they liked that. There have been a few newer observations, but very few non-technical people knew about that. Galileo's book was fun, and there was a pretty place. So the book went all over Europe incredibly fast. Uh, he'd shown the moons of Jupiter, as we said. That proves exactly nothing. You know, if I can show that at UP, uh, lessons start at 9 o'clock in the morning, that proves nothing but about the time at which lessons start here. It's basically irrelevant. But it was just a rhetorical device. He said, um, he, he, he said, ah, well, why not? Let's start lessons at 9 o'clock. And his system was simple, but there is nothing in real science which says that the real world is actually simple. It's very convenient for scientists to choose a, um, a simple theory as opposed to a complicated theory. We all do it all the time. But that does not prove that the simple theory is true and complicated theory is false. So, going to conclusions, what do I get? If we look at the theory at the time it's produced, he said no theory is ever adequate for all purposes. You know, um, Galileo's theory or Benedict's theory was better than the preceding one, but Kepler's was better than Benedict's. Newton's was better than Kepler. After Newton, uh, Einstein discovered that actually the theory, Newton's theory doesn't work for objects which are moving very, very fast. So even that had a limit. And today, physicists are even arguing about whether Einstein's theories are correct. So, so um, Copernican's theory was very good, it was very adequate to explain some things at this time, but that doesn't mean we can use it for everything. None of these theories 
represents an absolute theory, although some theories can be more radical than others. If I try and launch a spaceship and plan its trajectory using Ptolemy's theory, I'm going to get some very, very bad results. So, but at the time, when we're producing our theories, when we're looking at our facts, we don't actually know which ones work and which ones don't. Now, I can draw some broader philosophical conclusions from that. Well, there's at least two sets of conclusions I can draw which are opposed to each other. I can be postmodern skeptic. I could say the whole of science, all everything we consider as a fact, is socially constructed. And lots of people do say that. In fact, I would say it, I don't draw the same conclusion as they do. I could say that which when I have two competing theories, when I have a disagreement between two theories, <coughs> who's going to win depends on rhetoric. Remember that Galileo wrote an amusing, funny book. This does actually count. So rhetoric is very important, and power is very important. If Galileo hadn't found lots of Protestant princes who wanted, and lots of bourgeois people who didn't like the traditional philosophy, he wouldn't have gone where he went. We never know the truth, so says the skeptic. We can't know anything. And even if I accept the argument of adequacy, which most of them have never heard of, but even if I do, uh, you can only judge in the very, very long term. Today we know that Galileo was more or less correct. But at the time of Galileo, we had no reason to make that judgment. That's what the skeptics say. But I wouldn't accept that. I, I think we can have a positive vision of disagreement and of social construction, where we actually build new things. So first of all, when there are new conditions, when, they, when we get new knowledge, for instance, when we introduce new instruments like the, like the telescope, or like the huge telescopes we're building today, well then, the theory which was adequate before is no longer adequate. I see it just doesn't work. So I can construct a new theory. And here the adequacy really does count. But it's but I would insist that just as important when we're talking about this sort of scientific fact, or when we're talking about scientific theories, they are not the absolute truth. They're something which we build. My difference with the postmoderns is I don't think that's a bad thing. We build bridges of social constructions. Bridges work. So the fact that something is a social construction but it's not perfect, if it's not the ultimate truth, if it's not the total truth, does not mean in any sense that it's not useful. We do this, and do it as part of what makes us human. Um, so that is basically what I have to say for today's lecture. Um, up to now, I've been describing different kinds of disagreement. We looked at values, um, we looked at disagreements about facts and theories. But obviously there's a question which you all have in mind, which I have in mind is, how should we conduct ourselves when there's a disagreement? Uh, what is possible? What is, what works? So the next lecture I'm going to start to shift away from the descriptive part to a more normative part. I'm going to talk about, this time, an imaginary disagreement within a personal relationship. And it seems to be an intractable disagreement, one which has no solution. Of course, we don't like that particular personal relationship is important to us. So I'm going to explore 
in the face of something which is an intractable, apparently intractable disagreement, how can we possibly solve it? The case I'm going to look at in the next lecture is imaginary, and then the lecture after that, I'm going to look at some real cases where people have actually managed to solve apparently intractable problems. So, that's it for today. Um, I had to go a little bit fast because I covered a lot of ground in going from the ADHD case to the astronomy case. I hope I was forgetting, but if you have any questions or things you need to clarify, please ask. Or again, things you want to object. Yes. Um, so, uh, I guess clarification first, and then I have a question if my understanding is correct. So, uh, when you're uh, is the point about the point about the adequacy? It's a metric for like it's when you're choosing how to resolve like a disagreement. Like it's adver. I mean, you're saying that we should look at adequacy more than like looking for a final truth. Yeah, it's about yeah. which one is more adequate. It's a sort of pragmatic useful. Point of view. Yeah. yeah, useful. So, uh, but it seems to me like usefulness is already very value laden, right? I mean. Uh, yeah. When you're trying to decide which one is more adequate or which one is more useful, that's already that's absolutely a good point. Yeah. So, like, I guess the example we think of like economics, right? When you're talking about like comparing, I'm, I'm not an economist yeah. either, so I'm I won't get too technical. But like the idea of like neoclassical economics, right? Of of uh, growth oriented that we have to produce, it's it's useful in certain contexts for certain interests, but like an indigenous community or a uh, worker class, com uh, working class uh, it be person, it it's be awful. Different. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah. Okay, so I haven't said this, and I think I should. But you should please. Can you write these comments up into the lecture notes? You don't have the lecture yet. You will have it this evening. Um, write this up. I think it's a very good point, and I haven't mentioned it. So the usefulness I'd like to talk about is not a universal usefulness. So. I think the idea of truth and falsity is the idea that there exists a universal truth, something which is always true, a universal falsity, something which is always false. And if we just say a universal usefulness or a universal lack of usefulness, we haven't really improved things much. You know, we're talking basically in the same terms. I'd like to be a bit more Nietzschean about this. I think we should talk about usefulness from the point of view of the people concerned and their own values. So let's take two cases. Um, in one case, we actually have a shared value. So for instance, in the particular case of my friend, uh, there's no value conflict there. We both want her to be well. Uh, and we want people in similar conditions to be well. And that's basically our only interest, you know, I don't, you know, neither of us are taking money from drug companies and so on. So basically we can discuss, it's easy for us to discuss in terms of usefulness. You know, she says, it works. And I say, this is going to get you into problems. If it doesn't, she's right and I'm wrong. So when we have a shared interest, which we, is genuinely shared, not an illusion of being shared, then I think it's rather easy to talk about usefulness. Now in some cases, and there's one I'm going to talk about in lecture seven, there may not be a shared value, or it may be very, very hard to construct. You mentioned, you know, um, I'm a neoliberal capitalist, and I will tell you that to maximize growth, I do A, B, C, D. And you will reply, uh, yes, but from the point of view of the worker uh, in the factory, with real wages have been going down for the last 40 years, this hasn't maximized anything useful. In fact, it's, made it, it's actually made its life worse. Well, then I think we have to be actually, we actually have to create our own judgments. So if I am doing, I'm not sure that is, in fact, I'm sure that isn't a universal usefulness. I have to say, for me, this is useful. I can then try and frame the argument in such a way that we actually do have a shared value. We can maybe adjust the framework a bit so we can actually share something where we didn't at the beginning. But I mustn't go for an illusionary shared value. Just because something says it's useful for everybody, that's open to criticism. You know, 
and the Marxist criticism of neoliberal economics does precisely that. I think it's good that it should work. So usefulness to me is relative to the person or better the group which we're evaluating for. It's not some you can't be useful in the absolute sense. Am I useful for virus? Am I useful for mosquitoes? It makes no sense. You know, my struggle against the dangerous mosquito is not with mosquitoes. But I still go, I still go for it. That was a very good question. Please work if you can write it up. It would be helpful for me. We're, we're planning to turn these lectures into a book. And I plan to have useful objections, questions, everything else as part of the book. There's also an opportunity, I think Jack has told you, that if people are interested in actually writing a detailed contribution to the book, maybe a case study of some disagreement we've been involved in, we're very interested in hearing from you. Nobody has any more questions? Uh, I'll ask because I'm, I'm very interested in the ADHD example. Yeah. Um, and um, I want to talk about the differences between that example and the abortion example on the other. Yeah. Um, because I think if you are going to insist on the factual nature of the dispute between is ADHD an actual illness or whether some specific person has an illness, you can say, well, you can wait for more de developments in psychology and neuroscience, and then after a while, you know, decades into the future, yeah. we'll have a better answer. Sure. And, and that would settle, like, that could settle. Yes, that could settle it. Um, in, in, in which case, we can attribute part of the intractability of the disagreement to a set of unknowns. Like at this. Yes, at present. Yeah. But if we talk about the debate about whether abortion should be legalized in the Philippines, I cannot imagine a set of unknowns that, you know, once That's we have the data. We'll just decide the Yes, debate. yes. Yeah, so, so in that sense, there seems to be like the difference between a factual disagreement on the one hand, something that we can say is um, valuing. So, of course, I think most disagreements have elements of fact and elements of evaluation. Right. So right. even in the abortion case, I want to know, for instance, what are the actual effects of illegal abortion? Uh, does it reduce abortion? Does it increase abortion? How many how many women die because it's yeah. illegal and so on? But then there is that's obviously combined with a value judgment about what I believe about abortion. Now in this case, yes. Fact, again, facts are definitely part of it. If I can find some real change in the, in the brain which precedes the emergency symptoms and which maybe I can treat, well then, yes, those facts would possibly resolve the system, the problem. But I still have a question, there's still a definitional question about what is a disease. And that I don't think there are any facts which can tell me that a certain thing is a disease or not. But yes, it may be associated with a change in the body, but the direction of causation, whether it's the disease or yeah. So we, you know, is mental suffering a disease or not? I think that's a question of how we split up the world. Or is it so radically different that we say maybe it's a disease, but it's just not treated by medicine, we're treated in a different way? Or it's not treated by what we currently recognize as medicine. So, you know, for a very long time it was treated spiritually by talking to wise people or spiritual leaders. And this also was, treated, I think it probably wasn't much less effective than what we have today. So, I don't think your facts are going to be true. You have to find a very clear fact to prove it really was. So, really. That we have, we are forced to adopt a disease classification. Yeah. Maybe we can, but today those facts don't exist. Another good question. Right here, okay? Other questions? Yes. I guess, like, as you go on examples of like um, 
of like factual disagreement. I think one avenue you can go for is nutrition. Because nutrition is one of the messiest places where you get disagreements. For instance, like right now we're in the age where all the food is low fat but obesity is at the high. And then we had butter back then for the longest time. But, right? And it's it's a very good avenue to argue for because there's so many facts out there and so many papers. But even then, nobody can come to a clear conclusion. Uh, I think there's something to about um, there's actually been a lot of work recently on the reproducibility of results in nutritional epidemiology. Uh, I recommend you read papers by a man called John in the 90s. And basically, the results are that most of the results are harmonious. Like, there's almost no results about nutrition, either about things being harmful or about them being good. <coughs> Which stand up to scrutiny. We're very close to zero. The studies, the trouble is, all the studies, you can't, we can't, so this is real science. All the studies are observation. That means I get a group of people and I study what happens. Um, but that means they're all subject to massive confounding. That means there's other factors which can explain what I, I observe. So, for instance, I find that. Uh, Black teenagers in the US have very high death rates. And they die from, even apart from violence, they die from lots of diseases. And they also eat lots of fast, fast food. But is the death from the diseases due to the fast food, or is it just due to the fact that they're poor? Uh, and all, it's, this is incredibly difficult, even when you're very honest. It's very, very hard. So they'll separate out, separate out these factors. Now, um, now uh, the way you could do it in principle is you could run experiments and say, I am going to completely eliminate all your daily products from your diet for 25 years. And another group, which I'm going to randomize, I'm not going to, you have to do that. You want to know if it's on mortality, that's what you have to do. So of course, you can't do that experiment. I can change someone's diet for six weeks. Yeah, sure. If I've got heroic volunteers, I can change it for six months. Or a year. <laughs> yeah. But I can't change your diet for, your, for half your life. And yet the effects which have been hypothesized are lifelong effects. You know, no one serious believes that eating fast food for six weeks is going to change your life. But some people believe that eating for six years might change your life. But I can't test that. So our uh, current results are really bad. But what I did, so I'd say the different theories are all equally true or false. Uh, but there are theories which are negative. Uh, the other day, I took a, a grab from my cat here, falling rain, so I had lots of time to watch the screen where they were advertising to me. And there was a wonderful video which I wanted to copy. I can't find it on YouTube because so I want to copy it and send it to the whole world about the health benefits of butter. Did you know that it's proved that butter gives you extra brain power? Uh, that butter prevents cancer? Uh, that butter prevents heart disease? And there were like, three or four more of it. It was wonderful. Like, it was so completely imaginative that, you know, it's amazing that you couldn't do that in, in other countries. You wouldn't put the guy in jail. But, uh, but it, I'm not saying, so, there is actually some research that says butter isn't too bad for you, actually. So to make all these positive claims and to save your life, I think it's really going to be too so fun. So that is what I call an inadequate set of facts. Uh, the other ones are undecided. Maybe sometime we can work out some wonderful research methodology to play it up. But the facts are, we know that one or two things we do know. Tobacco is desperately bad for you. That's, that's a fact. It's established. Exercise is good for you. That's a fact. Loneliness is bad for you. That's about all we know about environmental factors. The rest is, we're working on it. Yes? Um, what about the uh, a lot of people are dying of cancer, right? Yeah. And one of the things that's being questioned is the efficacy of chemotherapy yeah. from cancer. So I don't know whether it was Johns Hopkins which came out with a study which said it's only 10% effective against cancer. 
Well, it's, it's, a, it's a tragic case. It depends, um, this is not really a philosophy discussion, but um, it depends. It, there are a very few cancers where we have extremely effective therapy. Right? For some lung cancers, you can have very effective therapy. For some very early breast cancers, you can have very effective therapy. There are a few cancers where we know the mutation which is causing the cancer. We have very effective therapy. The rest of the therapy hasn't changed enormously in 30, 40 years. I don't know the actual numbers. Uh, it's probably better than nothing, but, but the, the numbers don't look great. And the fact we have much more cancer, one of the reasons, one of the simple reasons is we're living longer. Cancer is a disease of age. Most cancers are older people, but we're not dying of other things, so more of us are dying of cancer. It might, there might be environmental factors in the but it's not really a problem. So, again, so basically my message about all these scientific facts is we do know so We really do. We have some theories which really are adequate. So I'm not a postmodernist in any way. It's not, they're not all in there. I can point a rocket to the cuts of uh, uh, Neptune, and it's going to get there. That's absolutely amazing. You can fly from from Manila to any city in the world, and virtually none of you will die. It's, it's amazingly safe and effective and reliable. And that's based on a huge number of different scientific results all put together. So all that's true. It's also true that there's a huge marketing of science. So if you read the medical journals, there's a new miracle cure for some cancer every week. Um, for forms of heart disease and mental disorders too. And nearly all of them prove failures. So we do know some stuff really, but we know much less than the marketing people tell us we know. There's huge areas of darkness, huge areas where we don't know yet. So don't be skeptical of all science. The best science is wonderful, but be skeptical the whole time. And I think that's a good attitude to have. I never believe what the money from the person tells you, ever. <laughs> if they're right, they're right by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Other questions? For, for, for all of us, you may have guessed I'm more of a scientist than a philosopher. Okay, so thank you very much again. Um, next Monday, same time, same place, and we're going to be discussing a dispute, a disagreement within a couple. I'm told by reliable authority that this is the sort of dispute people have very, very often. <laughs> okay, see you on the next.